My topic is Darwin's Tree of Life and what is currently happening to it in relation to unexpected evidence. Uh, an ocean of genomic data that when I was a student, I, I simply wouldn't have believed if you had told me this was going to be discovered within the past 15 years. And I'll end with some speculations about how the notion of intelligent design may help us grapple with these data. And for that, I'm going to use the, the whiteboard here. Uh, but this is something I find tremendously exciting, and I hope to convey that to you. So normally in a talk like this, one begins uh, with an outline, which I'll do in a moment, and ends with acknowledgments. But I want to begin with my acknowledgments because the questions that I asked with the two scientists I'll be showing you are directly relevant to my topic this morning, or actually this afternoon now. Lee Van Valen was an evolutionary biologist on my dissertation committee at Chicago. And uh, after I defended, he and I then for really a decade had weekly conversations about the issues raised by this talk. Um, it's funny, when my daughters met him in his lab at Chicago, his hair had turned completely white and way, had grown way down on his shoulders and his beard was totally white and quite long and they called him Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a big, he was a, a big fan of Tolkien and he was delighted to be so named. The other person with whom uh, I, I've worked on these questions is very much alive and well, and flourishing at uh, Queen Mary College, University of London, and that's Richard Buggs. And I believe Richard has been to some of the ELF meetings in the past. In any case, uh, the question I asked with Lee is this, if the theory of common descent were false, how would we know it? In fact, this question is on the first page of my dissertation. And my dissertation attempts to answer that. The question I've asked with Richard is, what is the role of orphan genes in biology and evolution? Now, I'll explain a little bit later what I mean by this term. You'll just have to bracket it for the moment. These questions turn out to be intimately related to each other, uh, as I'll show you. And they're strongly motivating. When you ask these questions, they have all kinds of interesting implications that come tumbling out. So what I need to do before we get to the evidence, the data themselves, which is always the, the most interesting part of a talk like this, so I'll save the best for last, is provide a logical framework within which we can evaluate the data. Often in a talk like this, the speaker will go straight to the evidence, leaving aside this framework, and the problem is then it's hard to see how the, the evidence actually challenges the theory in question. So I want to lay that framework out as quickly as possible, and then we'll look at the evidence uh, that fills in the framework. So how did Darwin and his intellectual offspring, neo-Darwinian paradigm, Test common descent, well, there's a fundamental principle that they formulated that's come to have the name the principle of continuity. All right, now, once we've got that in place, it may violate the principle of continuity and therefore falsify common descent. So just to give you a reminder of what common descent is, here's a textbook I used as a student. I studied evolutionary biology at the University of Pittsburgh in the early 80s. Note the page number here. You are entering the discipline of evolutionary theory via the gateway of this claim, namely that all living things on this planet have descended from a common ancestor. The first proposition you learn as you begin to uh, uh, study the theory. Here's another textbook I used. Again, note the page number. It's very early in the case that they're making. What is the primary assertion or claim of evolutionary theory? It asserts that all organisms are related. Well, if you do the set theory, and I won't this morning for lack of time, but if you do the basic set theory, the only way this can be true is if there is a member in the set of ancestors of, of every organism on this planet that is universally shared across all such sets. Uh, and that can be proved with, with rigor. I'll just give you this famous picture because it conveys the same idea. Now, this doesn't look like a tree. Right? But it could be a tree if you imagine yourself hovering above it, let's say, in a helicopter or on a very high ladder looking down on a large oak tree with three major branches and the root going into the ground is here. 
So these are the three major domains of life on this planet, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. All the interesting, warm, fuzzy things you see on an animal channel in the States, cable channel like Animal Planet, are located on this branch. And the scary things like sharks, right? So the creatures with which we're most familiar are actually only a tiny part of the full diversity of life on this planet. The important logical point from a figure like this is it is universal. There is a domain here that takes in every living thing on this planet, whether it is alive today or was in the past, and nothing exists biologically on planet Earth outside that domain. Now, for a biologist, that, that kind of universal scope is very important because you can think of biology as a science of exceptions. So, you know, oxygen carriers in blood render it red, except when they don't. You have hemocyanin, you get a different color. So for pretty much any generalization you come up with in biology, you can find a counterexample or an exception to that. In this case, you can't, because the, the theory is formulated with a universal quantifier in front of it. Namely, if you are an organism or were on this planet, you are related to the last universal common ancestor here at the root. And that kind of Unification is very important for scientists because we want theories to do work for us, namely compress experience, and then we carry those theories around in our pocket, and they provide power, explanatory power for us because they do compress so much experience. So I want to acknowledge the power, even the aesthetic elegance of this theory of common descent, uh, and course, make the distinction that power and elegance do not equate to truth, although they can be very seductive, <laughs> as the history of science shows. Now, common descent throughout most of my education was very deeply embedded in my modern biological thinking. So Francisco Ayala, in a paper that I read as a first-year graduate student, he said, it's like the roundness of the earth or the motion of the planets. A properly educated person, not even a scientist, just a, a properly educated person would not doubt the theory. It's part of the furniture of reality, so to speak. Ernst Meyer, who had a long career, uh, first in Europe and then at Harvard, right up to 100 years of age, in 1991 put it this way, there's nobody alive who would doubt that all organisms have descended from a single origin of life. Okay, now the funny thing about this statement is even then, in 1991, it wasn't true. In 1991, I was writing, beginning to write my dissertation, I could find very senior evolutionary biologists, not crazy intelligent design people like me, who doubted this. What's he conveying here? What he is conveying is a climate of opinion, namely that every person Ernst Meyer runs into at Harvard, <laughs> right, thinks this way. And since the, you know, the people past the Charles River somewhere in Nebraska don't count, right, until you get, to, you get to the West Coast in Berkeley where everyone thinks this way. In other words, there, he's accurately conveying a climate of opinion in which he just doesn't interact with people who doubt the theory. So here's a little table. And while I was writing my PhD, I discovered that there were safe topics in historical or theoretical biology that you could have a flourishing career working on, and you could get funded, right? So that's a crystal bowl right there in the middle of the table. Then there were the risky topics, where that bowl has been shoved over now close to the edge, where it might topple off. You can still work on them, although funding will be much harder to obtain. Questioning common descent was down here. <laughs> okay, you just didn't do it. I would go to evolutionary biology meetings and ask biologists, what if common descent were true? How would you know that? And they would you know, glance down at their watch and <laughs> get this expression on their face, like, what is the first socially appropriate moment that I can get away from this person, right? <laughs> All right, so this is a climate of opinion. Again, you, you, know, you know, they say, well, he's a crazy philosopher, so he can ask that question. Things have changed dramatically in the decade or so since then, more than a decade. So in January 2009, New Scientist magazine, which is not run by creationists as far as I know, 
<laughs> I'm sorry? It certainly is not. Ran this cover story, Darwin was wrong, cutting down the tree of life. And uh, this poor science writer, Graham Lawton, was excoriated on the web by people like Richard Dawkins, who said, I'll never have anything to do with new scientists again. You're simply pandering to the creationists. But if you actually read the article, and Lawton ably defended himself in, in response to these charges, he said, look, all I'm doing is reporting what theoretical biologists are saying about problems with this tree, such as Carl Woese at the University of Illinois, uh, from whom I learned a great deal when I was a second year graduate student. I was at a workshop where Woese uh, was speaking, and his candor shocked me. He spoke so honestly about the defects in evolutionary theory that I thought, you know, there's something about this guy that I have to follow. So I read pretty much everything he published. And towards the end of his career, he died in 2012. In the last decade of his career, he was very outspoken about the failures of the universal tree picture. So in this paper in the PNAS, which I believe now is open access, you can just go and download it, he says it's a doctrine. And that capital D, that's his noun. Right? This is not a term of praise for Carl Woese. A doctrine in that sense is something standing in the way of scientific understanding. He says we've got to go beyond this doctrine of common descent. And maybe during the Q&A we can talk a little bit about the lines of evidence that persuaded him that, that the Darwinian picture wasn't true. But this journal, which I love, Biology Direct, it's all open access, and they publish the referee reports right next to the papers themselves, so you can watch the debate go on between the referees and the authors. They're running a series called Beyond the Tree of Life, uh, and I think it's up to about a dozen papers now, where uh, a variety of different uh, biologists are looking for better geometries to represent the history of life. In any case, what I wanted to indicate is that things are changing rapidly within evolutionary theory about the single tree picture in a way that I, I never would have expected as a student. Nevertheless, in the background of most evolutionary biologists' imagination is this picture. Now, this is not a proper phylogenetic diagram. You could never publish something like that. It's simply a cartoon to indicate that there's a singularity at the beginning of life on this planet within a domain outside of which there is no biology. This picture of a primordial singularity 3.2 or some billion years ago from which everything sprang still does maintain its place in the thinking of most biologists. But it could be false. Many biologists, as I've just showed you, and I'll give you more later in the talk, think it is false. How are we going to answer this question? Now, unless we hold the theory as an axiom, which we should not do. And I'll tell you, when I talk to biologists about common descent and point out to them that they're, whether they're conscious of it or not, they're holding the theory axiomatically, they refuse to do that. So in interactions with Lee Van Valen, some of our long conversations, uh, I told him, I said, Lee, you're holding the theory and you're not letting it be challenged by observation. And he would say, well, I don't want to do that because there's a world of difference between mathematics and logic, where axioms are appropriate, and empirical studies where axioms are not. We need to have the evidence of nature confront our theories. How would we answer this question? So here was Darwin's proposal. Now, this location in The Origin of Species is in chapter six. It's the chapter right in the middle of the book where Darwin recognizes he's got to take some questions. All right, he was a superb rhetorician of science, really a, a, a subtle psychologist. And he knew that at that point in his book, there were going to be lots of hands in the back of the room waving. Mr. Darwin, I have a question. So he fields difficulties and questions, in a sense, to relieve the tension that's been building up in the reader. One of those questions is, if the theory weren't true, how would you know? So what Darwin says, look, any complex organ, now it doesn't have to be an organ that is some, some gross anatomical structure, any biological feature which could not have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, that could be demonstrated, my theory would absolutely break down. Now, these adjectives aren't important to the test. 
Darwin thought that evolutionary change was more likely to occur if the increment of change were small, but the logic of the test really says there must be some natural pathway, whatever the size of the increment is. So go back to our domain, we take one of these segments from Luca. Now B, there's an evolutionary pathway here, B still lies within the domain. So this would not falsify the theory. But B prime might exist outside the domain. If this were a real observation and we could not establish a natural pathway from the rest of biology, in particular from LUCA, last universal common ancestor, to B prime, if B prime resists being connected to the rest of biology, the domain is no longer universal and the theory would fail. That would be a significant observation. Now, Darwin himself understood this. So in his correspondence with Asa Gray, great Christian botanist at Harvard, a theistic evolutionist, uh, during that correspondence, Gray pressed Darwin on what Darwin would consider falsifying evidence, to use Popper's language. What would test the theory? And Darwin says, look, if you found a being made entirely of metal, right, like us, some complex being made entirely of metal, that would do it. But in the very next sentence he says, but this is childish writing. Why? Well, he you know, never expects to see a metallic being, but he says, if such a thing were real, it would lie outside the domain. There would be no natural pathway connecting it to the rest of life. And that would, that would refute my, my theory because the universality of common descent would be violated. Now, even though in his correspondence he calls this childish writing, in the origin itself he proposes this as a sober test. And it's come to have a name, the principle of continuity, which once you become aware of it, you will see absolutely everywhere in evolutionary biology because it is a key tool that biologists use to adjudicate or judge the plausibility of each other's adaptive scenarios. And I'll give you a, co a couple of examples, but let's quickly just define it. And really, it's simplicity itself. It says, if you have a hypothesis of transformation, so your hypothesis for the origin of B is that it, it arose along this pathway from starting point A, all right, so that's your hypothesis connecting those two, then every point on that pathway must be biologically possible. Now, this may seem to be a truism, you say, well, Paul, of course it's got to be possible. Otherwise, I wouldn't have postulated that. In fact, in the dialogue or, or in the debates within evolutionary theory, it's often the case that a, a theorist will propose a pathway like this, and another theorist will come along and say, you've neglected the following aspects that must be satisfied along this pathway. Your mechanism or process that will give you this pathway doesn't actually solve the problems raised by it, therefore your hypothesis fails. And in, in fact, the formulation of a hypothesis like this and the evidence we bring to bear to evaluate it are assessed independently of each other, which gives the principle of continuity great power as a test. For instance, this can't happen. You cannot go through a gulf where you're dead for five minutes or even 30 seconds. An inviolable transitional state by itself will rule out that pathway. There's an important logical point I want to touch on briefly here. These have to be kept independent of each other. The principle of continuity must be maintained on a level playing field with common descent itself if it is in fact going to function as a test for common descent. But let me give you a couple of examples of how this functions in action. So Leslie Orgel was an RNA chemist began his career in the UK and then went to the Salk Institute in San Diego, who worked on the origin of life. In particular, he worked on the problem of the origin of information transfer, going from nucleic acid, DNA to RNA to protein, asking how did that system arise? And in a famous paper in the late 60s, he says, I'm going to look at some evolutionary hypotheses that are out there. What's going to guide me? What will be my principal analytical tool? It will be the principle of continuity itself. And he says, it's very difficult to see how a totally different biological organization could have undergone a continuous transition to the nucleic acid system with which we are familiar. So here's a little cartoon. 
He's beginning here with the terrestrial biochemistry we understand fairly well, DNA, RNA, protein. And he says there are hypotheses in the literature that say that the original information transfer system, excuse me, was built on a different kind of chemistry, not using nucleic acid or the 20 amino acids, 22 now, with which we are familiar. And Orgel says, continuity rules this out because at some point you're going to have to transfer all the information you've accumulated using this chemistry over to a very different kind of chemistry, maintaining viability in this transition zone. And he says that's just not possible as far as he could judge. So using the principle of continuity, he excludes this hypothesis and says whatever system we have today, the primary elements of that system must be present all the way back to the starting point. That's the only thing that's biologically possible. So here you see it in action near the origin of life, but can also be used when you look at uh, organismal evolution, like the origin of the animal phyla. Lewis Wolpert is a developmental biologist in the UK who works on the problem of the origin of development, the origin of the animals. And again, this is a paper from the early 1990s. He's evaluating a hypothesis for the origin of the invertebrate phyla. And he says there's a, there's a Proposal out there that the ancestral form to all of these different groups was something like a larva. A few thousand cells, relatively undifferentiated. So here are six phyla present in the Cambrian explosion. Some of them, like this one, don't exist anymore. But the hypothesis he's evaluating looks like this. You've got a relatively simple larval form drawn two different ways here. This is a hypothetical entity, or bilateria, thought to be ancestral to all of these different groups. Wolpert says, I can't buy it. Why? It violates the continuity principle. How could a larva evolve the ability to metamorphose into the complex forms of the adult? The intermediate steps required are completely improbable. So looking at this hypothesis, hypothesis with continuity in mind, he says these pathways could not be instantiated by real biology because the intermediate steps are not biologically feasible. And again, he rules out that pathway using continuity. But there's a logical problem with continuity when you come to universal common descent. How could anything lie outside a universal domain? The very formulation of a theory has already placed everything within its scope. So what's out there? What could possibly be out there? Now that may seem to stall out continuity as a test. In fact, Darwin himself and neo-Darwinians came up with a very clever solution. They used counterfactual conditionals to populate that space out there. We call this counterfactual space. Counterfactual conditionals have the following logical form. If it were the case that, and we'll fill this in with some observation. Now, it's not going to be a real observation. It's going to be counterfactual. We say, we can imagine seeing the following. If we saw the following, then we would know that common descent is false, where the clause before the comma, the first clause here, is always going to be counterfactual. And we use these all the time. You, just, you may not give them a name. Here's one from my life that I hope I never observe. This is my wife. Okay, I've got about 1,500 books in my research library at home, in my office, in my house. I can imagine seeing the entire contents of my research library piled on the curb when I get home <laughs> to Chicago on Saturday. The likely signal I would take from that is marital discord, <laughs> okay? <laughs> she would never do that. She would email, email or text me first, but, you know. Because <laughs> she wouldn't want to do all the work of hauling all those books out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but this is, this is how this logical problem has been solved. So, one would not expect to, assert, to observe a lot of unique genes and proteins. Now, that, that's what we're going to come back to very shortly. One would not expect to observe variant genetic codes or incongruent phylogenies where the tree built for some group based on anatomy or morphology is incongruent with the tree based on their molecules. One would not expect to observe out-of-order fossils where their stratigraphy does not correspond to their likely appearance in evolutionary history based on a cladogram. Now the funny thing about all of these 
is they've all been observed. Okay? When I was a student, there was a single genetic code. You could look it up in the Watson et al. molecular biology textbook, a single 64 trinucleotide translation table between the realm of nucleic acid and the realm of amino acids. Now, there are so many variant codes that the NCBI maintains a web page where you have to go look up the code for your particular organism. So if you're working, let's say, with ciliated protozoa, like tetrahymena, ciliated protozoa, like tetrahymena, have a single stop codon, and they assign the other two to glutamine. The problem is, if you read through the universal code, take your nucleic acid sequence, read through the universal code to predict protein structure, and you're using an organism that has a variant code, you will make a severe mistake at that point uh, because you're going to predict an incorrect protein sequence. There's a very interesting debate online between Craig Venter, the human genome guru, and Richard Dawkins about this very point. Dawkins was saying to the public, I know that all organisms are related because they all have the same genetic code. And Venter interrupts him and he says, that's not true. <laughs> he said, I've been working with mycoplasma and your genes, Dawkins, would not work in mycoplasma because mycoplasma has a variety of changed assignments. And Dawkins' jaw drops. <laughs> you can see it right there on the video. It's, it's really, really a striking exchange. All right, what's happened in these three cases? What's happened is the outer, the outer surface of this domain has swelled to take them in. Okay? Now, that's not a healthy position for a science to be in. Because what it means is your predictions aren't being given the dignity of failing. In this case, it didn't swell. In this case, the outer sphere expanded and scientists began to say, no, we can't, we can't squeeze that in. We can't squeeze that in. The domain is actually not universal. So let's focus on that one. One might think that you've got a domain like this and it's been well searched. And I know real organisms are more interesting than little colored boxes in PowerPoint, all right? But those, that just meant, means diversity. You might think we've really searched that domain. In fact, only a tiny portion of it has been searched with respect to genetics or genomics. This technology, automated DNA sequencing, in a way that I think is really hard to grasp unless you are living in the literature on a daily basis like I do. This has totally revolutionized our understanding of life on this planet. This graph helps you to grasp that. Okay, so I'm an undergrad at Pitt studying evolutionary biology right here. I start at Chicago here. I defend right about here. Most of what we know about the genetics of life on this planet has been learned since then. And this graph only goes to 2008. So this curve now is up through the ceiling, well up through the ceiling. This shows the growth of sequence, sequence information deposited in GenBank, the computerized database supported by US tax dollars. There's a different one here in, in Europe. And as this information accumulates, the signal that's in there is increasingly hard to ignore. And the one that I'm going to focus on for the remainder of my time is the puzzle of orphan genes. Now, there's a pun in this title. An ORF is an open reading frame in molecular biology. It's a sequence of DNA that codes for protein, and it has characteristic features that you can write algorithms to detect, such as a start site for initially the RNA polymerase, but then later on for the ribosome, a long sequence of codons, with no stops unless they're specially translated in those organisms that do that, and then a stop signal where this is long enough, or if you have a multiple exon sequence where the exons together are long enough to code for something that could actually fold up and do a job for you. And these features are so regular that in fact you can write algorithms to detect them. So you accumulate your nucleic acid data, submit it to these gene finding programs, and they kick out the ORFs. They tell you this is very probably something coding for protein. It's probably doubtless familiar to you, most of you with biology backgrounds. I wrote this talk for a general audience, so I apologize to the biologists in the room. Now, known sequences are annotated and deposited in GenBank with respect to their function. Okay, so here's our newly sequenced piece of DNA. And we submit it to GenBank to look for matches, very much the way you would do with a dictionary if you had a word you hadn't seen before. And we get a hit. 
Base pair by base pair, there are a large number of similarities in these two sequences. This one's already been deposited. We know it codes for a ribosomal protein. That tells us what our new sequence is doing. Now this sequence can join the dictionary. We add that to GenBank, and our knowledge of nucleic acid, the nucleic acid and protein universe grows as our dictionary gets larger. Except with orphans, it doesn't. As their name implies, we find no corresponding sequences. You, so you, using an algorithm like BLAST or some other matching algorithm, you submit your sequence and the report you get back says no, no match, nothing found. It's clearly a word. It has the features that make it look like an open reading frame that would code for protein, but there are no matches in the genetic dictionary. Now, this was noticed very early on by observers who were looking at the first whole genomes that were coming in. So Russell Doolittle is a very senior biologist at UCSD, member of the National Academy, who's devoted his career to the question of the molecular phylogenetics of life on this planet. And in a review paper in Nature in 2002, so he's looking at the signal right about here. I think there were about 60 genomes done at that point. Of course, it's very much stronger now, but even then he noticed what was going on. He said, we are finding vast numbers of putative genes for proteins of unknown function. Where are they coming from? This is the biggest surprise in genome sequencing. In every genome examined so far, at least a quarter of the genes remain hypothetical and that no function can be ascribed. Not what he expected, as you'll see in greater detail in a moment. He goes on, how could there be so much in the way of unknown equipment? There are large numbers of unidentified genes in a variety of organisms that look conventional in every way. Where these sequences are coming from and what they do remain baffling mysteries. Now, I need to make an important distinction, which I failed to do a few years ago at a talk in Florida. And there was a reporter uh, or a blogger in the audience from the anti-design website, The Panda's Thumb. And boy, did he make me pay for it. And the pain was so acute Pain is a great teacher, <laughs> okay? The pain was so acute that I, I committed that I would never give this talk without letting the audience know the distinction that I failed to make. And it's in, it is important. All orphans, by definition, are genes of unknown function. Because as I said to you a moment ago, when a gene is deposited and properly curated in GenBank, it has an associated function. It's not just dumped in there, okay? But there are genes of unknown function in you and genes of unknown function in other primates that are identical. We don't know what they do, but the fact that they're present in you and in other primates, by definition, makes them not orphans, because orphans, by the strictest definition, are species-specific. So the mnemonic is, all orphans are genes of unknown function, at least when initially discovered, as I'll show you later on, they come to have very important functions once they're properly assayed. All genes of unknown function, by contrast, are not orphans. So this is just a little Venn diagram to make that clear. All right? I can still feel the pain. <laughs> pain is a great teacher. All right, so here are all the sequences we've determined from some, from some species. Its total genome is here, and, and we've divided them into our orphans and our ORFs. Now, our ORFs will find matches. All right, our open reading frames that have matches will get the signal back from GenBank. That's what those genes are doing. You've seen them before. Oh, here's a little literary parallel for those of you who are not scientists but know your classical authors. Might his quietus with a bare bod can make. Does anybody recognize that line? It's Shakespeare, but which play? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Hamlet, of course, the Germans know. <laughs> Why are they always the smartest people in the room? That's what. <laughs> yeah, it's from the most famous soliloquy, the to be or not to be soliloquy. Okay, I don't use these words normally in English speech or writing. I, I hear them when I go to hear Hamlet, see Hamlet perform. So I submit them to the OED and I get back their meanings. Now I know what they're doing in that sentence that Hamlet is saying. I could kill myself with a little knife. Well, the, the parallel to genetics is remarkably strong. These are genetic words with no matches, yet they are clearly words. They have all the features of 
to use the literary parallel, natural language parallel, all the features of genetic words. Now, early on, again, this is 2003, so not a lot of genomes have accumulated at this point, but people are noticing how puzzling orphans are. So this Israeli team looks at them and says, these are mysteries awaiting analysis. If evolution works through descent with modification, why is it that no similar sequences are found in other organisms? Where are the necessary intermediates that must have given rise to these orphans? Doolittle himself, in a, in a later review paper, again now looking at a, a, a larger sample of genomes, but the same puzzle has got him scratching his head. In this paper in Nature, he says, we thought that we could use computer analysis alone to identify every gene in every organism that we sequence because we believe that extant genes descend from a smaller ancestral set by gene duplication and other processes. So here's the process picture he has in his mind. DNA codes for a protein, little ribbon and barrel diagram there, that is subject to a variety of evolutionary processes, which we thought we understood well, modifies the sequence, maybe we add an alpha helix here, but the, three, the, the backbone, the three-dimensional fold of these is largely the same. These are going to be assigned to the same protein family. There's a strong signal of history here. That shape and these sequences are going to leave a trace that you will be able to detect using matching algorithms. But that's not all that he has in his mind. He has this picture in his mind, the tree of life, where the genes and proteins in any extant organism should follow a family relationship back through time to the minimal set present in LUCA. Now, if you've got those two things in mind, in the background, common descent is not up for grabs. It's a given. It's not an issue. And new genes and proteins come from old by well-understood evolutionary processes. If one and two are the case, the very last thing you would expect are a lot of unknown genes and proteins. That's why Doolittle is scratching his head. And to my knowledge, he, that head scratching continues to today. But you can go into the literature and find people grappling with this, and really, they're, they're really sort of flustered by a puzzle that they really did not expect. So Kenneth Weiss at Penn State looking at this, in a paper in 2012, he says, where would these genes come from? Because they leave no traces. It challenges our fundamental assumption of the evolutionary method, namely that life is a single universally connected phenomenon. So he takes a sequence and submits it to GenBank and he gets back an orphan sequence and he gets back the no significant similarity found report. And he says, this is remarkable. GenBank is pretty comprehensive. Where did it come from? Nothing, we get nothing back. And he concludes this section of his paper if our theory of life, this is Darwinian common descent by known processes, is even remotely correct, such a result is exceedingly hard to explain. So he speculates, maybe it came from space. Okay. What I like about a paper like this is the signal is getting through the wall of theory. There's this famous aphorism from a 19th century British physicist, I think. A mask of theory covers the whole face of nature. This is a case where nature is breaking through the mask of theory and a, and a theoretician is having to grapple with what's there with respect to a theory he thinks is, is true. But the, the multiple implications of orphans just continue to astound me. So I'll give you just a few and I'm still on schedule. In bacteria with a circular chromosome, you can use transposon mutagenesis, where a piece of DNA that incorporates itself randomly into other DNA is introduced into the cell. And that transposon, and these are not to scale, I just made this bigger so you could read the name. That transposon will integrate randomly at various points in the chromosome, and you may hit essential hardware. You may knock out a gene and its protein product that that cell cannot do without, and they'll tell you. You won't be able to plate them out. You'll have nothing on your, on your agar. Same here. You've knocked out essential hardware, you get no growth. There's nothing there. Sometimes, however, the transposon will integrate and it won't hit essential hardware and you'll be able to grow those cells. From these colonies, working your way backwards and doing this over and over, you can map your way right around that whole chromosome, finding out where the essential genes and proteins are. 
and get a pretty good set of essential components for that particular bacterial species. Now, the only way you can do this experiment is, in fact, if you have a complete genome for that species, which in many cases is available. So this has been done multiple times, and, this, and the results are always interesting. So I'll look at just one paper from Lucy Shapiro's lab at Stanford, where they use Colobacter, which is a bacterium and the a proteobacteria that you can culture out of fresh water. I'm sure you know, streams in here in southern Poland are full of Colobacter. What they found were over 1,000 essential elements, 480 open reading frames, 402 regulatory sequences, 130 non-coding elements, including 90 segments of unknown function. That's nearly a tenth of the essential hardware. Nearly a tenth is of unknown function, and these are orphans. So Shapiro, in a commentary a news report on this experiment, she said, this is amazing. We don't know what these sequences are doing. They may, need us, they may lead us to new and completely unknown bacterial functions, but that's a sizable fraction of the essential hardware for Colobacter that is species-specific. Now, here's the evolutionary puzzle. Here's a Venn diagram from their paper where they compare the essential Colobacter sequences to the essential E. coli sequences. Uh, now, these are in the phylum proteobacteria. And years ago, uh, my student here told me that's a big phylum. And it is a big phylum, but they're still in the same phylum. So they are putatively evolutionarily related. This is a large fraction of unique hardware. This is a large fraction of unique hardware, respectively, for each of these species. If you did this again with another member of the proteobacteria, you would get a similar Venn diagram with some region of overlap and a very large fraction of unique sequences. What that means is these cells are not running their basic biochemistry the same way, or their basic molecular biology the same way. Homespun analogy, and people in Poland would have People in the EU generally would have too much taste ever to do this, but in the US, you can park cars out in your backyard and pop up the hoods and walk your way down the line. The first engine has essential parts A, B, and C. The second engine shares C with the first engine, so there are some shared elements, but then it has these unique features D and E. Again, C is shared, but then you've got G and X. In the fourth engine, only A is shared and B but then you've got unique element M. The essential parts of these engines are not the same. There's been significant tinkering among them to vary how they operate. And you see this over and over in different groups. So before I get to this example, how many of you have a phone with a spiraling cord that connects the hand set to the base? Am I the only one? All right. <laughs> Okay, what happens, if you don't, what happens if you don't periodically disconnect the cord? You have to let out the supercoiling, right? Because otherwise you get this, all right? Just a hopeless knot. My office phone, it, this, this happens once a week. And I've got to disconnect it, let out the supercoiling, and then plug it back in again. Topologically, the spiraling double helix of DNA faces the same problem. There are topological difficulties with handling a molecule like that that cells have to solve, and they do so using dedicated proteins called topoisomerases that cut the double helix either along one backbone or both. The ones that cut it along one are called topo1s, topo2s, cut both, to let out supercoiling to allow the cell to process the information. So here's a topoisomerase doing that job, and it's found in a single species. I love the title of this paper. This French investigator was really puzzled by this, and he said, how mean, here's the protein, by the way, how mean of Mother Nature to give this wonderful topoisomerase to a single archaean, it's a single-celled uh, organism that lives at very high temperature that would cook you and me. And in fact, because this exists at high temperature in, in the wild, it's used in a lab kit uh, where you have to process DNA at high temperature and actually is commercially very valuable. But in this paper, he says, this is really weird. We would not expect to see an essential protein like this found in a single species, given how important it is for the functioning of molecular biology as we know it. So with a, a colleague, they went and looked at the distribution of topoisomerases throughout all three domains. All right, now, quick thought experiment. 
What would you expect universal common descent to, to predict? Well, we can, do the, we can do it. Let's take the three domains. If our root is there, and it has a DNA genome, it's going to need topoisomerases. You can't live without them. It will probably have one topo1 and one topo2. These are very complicated proteins. Once you invent them with relation to DNA, everybody else gets a copy because you can't do without them. So if this particular geometry of relatedness is the case, you get a clear prediction from universal common descent that you should find ubiquitously distributed throughout the domains one topo1 and one topo2. All right, so here's what they say in their paper. They make the prediction, right? We'll find two homologous topoisomerases. But look who they offloaded onto. An intelligent designer would probably have invented only one topo1 and one topo2 to make life easier for biochemists. OK, this is taking my failed prediction and giving it to you to have to defend. This doesn't follow from intelligent design at all, all right? But they point out reality is much more interesting. And here's reality. OK, this is like a spaghetti bowl, all right? There's, there's no discernible logic with respect to the prediction. You can make out the three domains here. Here, are, here we are in the eukarya. Here are the bacteria. Here are the three major groups of the archaea. But there are so many different topoisomerases, and there are probably more, this paper is four years old, that they have to invent deus ex machina, you know, ancient viral reservoirs to give rise to these unique topoisomerases because they don't fit the prediction that clearly follows from common descent, which would be here at the root. You would see a ubiquitous distribution. This to me is a visual reductio ad absurdum of the prediction of, of common descent. But here's another feature, and that is the rate of discovery of orphans. And there's, a, there's a story to this particular paper that I'll tell you. A group in the UK in 2005 were interested in the trend. How, how many orphans are we going to find? They say, this is a surprise. We did not expect to find so many unique genes and proteins. So they said, what's, what's going to be the trend going forward? We would expect, they said, the trend of discovery to rise in a roughly linear fashion as we sample new genomes. And we think, they said, this will show no sign of leveling off. So here's a, paper, uh, here's a figure from their paper. And they've binned their data into two groups. So this line here, these are short orphans, shorter than 150 amino acids. These are the longer orphans here. This one's rising more rapidly than this, but they're both heading up. You can see when these species were sequenced, there was a big jump because they had a lot of orphans in their genomes. Now, I gave a talk at Dartmouth University in the States using this diagram uh, at this time, 2005, because I was already excited about orphans. And there was a microbiologist from the Dartmouth faculty sitting right in the front row. So the question and answer period arrives, and his hand shoots up. He wants to ask the first question. So I'm, you know, with trepidation, I call on him. And he said, Paul, what's in the numerator the numerator's on top, right? It's numerator and denominator. What's in the numerator position? 122 genomes. He says, what's in the denominator? <laughs> That's a classic example of a bad sample. He said, you're bound to be wrong. You've taken a tiny fraction of the total number of bacterial species on this planet, and you're generalizing on the basis of that. It's an artifact of sampling. And this was present in the literature at the time. When orphans were first discovered, one of the ways they were explained away is people said, we just haven't sampled enough. We have a sparse sample from the available space. As we sample more, the orphans will go away. So I had to swallow my pride and admit that 122, with respect to whatever this very large number is, is not a good sample. But you know what? That guy at Dartmouth was, was wrong, and I would love to get back there to talk to him about this. Because as the sample grew, the orphans didn't go away. So this group at the University of Connecticut did a really interesting experiment. They took 573 bacterial genomes, here are 14, just to give you an idea in this cartoon, and they randomly sampled genes from that batch. Just pulled them out, say gene XYZ, and they asked, who else in the 573 has this same gene? Who else has it present in their genome? And from that, they were able to plot a curve. And what they found was, 
remarkable, I'll go back to that other figure in a second, they said, our findings indicate that if you look at the pan genome, that's the genome of all bacterial species taken together, within the bacterial domain, it's of infinite size. Now this is hyperbole, right? There are not an infinite number of cells on this planet. What they really should say here is it's indefinitely large, but we can't see the outer bound of it. Meaning that every time you se sequence a new bacterial genome, you will see genes that you've never seen before. So in this cartoon here, they divide their data up in two ways. One is a little pie chart here where they show a representative bacterial genome. 64, excuse me, the, the smallest fraction, 8%, are those genes shared with every other bacterial species. 64%, this big slice here, are what they call character genes. These are genes and proteins related to some particular environmental niche that the species occupies. The largest group by far are the orphans. And it's a counting problem because these, because they are unique, will accumulate much more rapidly than these other two, which you will see in multiple cases. These universally. Okay? So, think about it this way. Here are the universally conservative, what they call core genes. Once you see them, and you see them in another species, you don't count them again. So, the type token distinction is actually useful here. These are just more tokens of the same type, so that bin is gonna, not going to grow very fast. This middle bin will grow a little faster because they're not as numerous. The orphans swamp everything because they are unique. You count them once, they go in the dictionary, and then because you're only counting them once and the fraction is so large in every genome, this bin rapidly gets bigger than these other two. They end up being far more numerous than shared sequences. These authors who work on the, the puzzle of orphans say because they represent a substantial fraction of every, every extant genome and are unique, they far exceed the number of known gene families because of the way they're counted. And there's no reason to expect this trend to change. Uh, in fact, orphans are accumulating at an increasing rate that correlates directly with the increasing rate of sequence, sequencing that's going on. So there are, re there are other puzzles. I told you, you just can't lose with orphans once you fall in love with them. Here's one. I put Richard Carhart in here as my evolutionary relative. The problem, <laughs> the problem is if all of the genetic information, and this is not a real phylogeny, it's just a little toy phylogeny, but the idea is it's comprehensive. It takes in you know, the, the major domains. I should have an Archean in there. The genome of LUCA, if it has to be ancestral to everything else, rapidly grows beyond anything that's biologically plausible. And this has come to be called the, guard, the genome of Eden problem. That LUCA just gets way too big, way too fast, beyond anything that would make biological sense. So what Ford Doolittle and others have done is they've said, this entity never existed because there's too much genetic diversity on this planet to be compressed into that kind of singularity. A related problem we can call the exploding gene inventory puzzle. So here's what you would expect from common descent. As you go back in time, the number of genes and proteins, the number of types of genes and proteins should go down dramatically because you're going to converge on the singularity that represents LUCA. In fact, what you see with orphans is exactly the opposite. As you go back, the number of known sequences that are unique grows unmanageably large because there are no antecedents. And you get exactly the reverse of what common descent predicts for the, the count, the gene count that you would have depending on the geometry of life. Now, horizontal transfer does not solve the problem. It just moves it around. This is a quote from Feynman where he's talking about his view. And Feynman, even though he was an atheist, had strongly theistic understanding of the start of our universe. He said... The, the beginning of our universe must have been a very special state indeed thermodynamically. And he said, and you can't solve the thermodynamic problem by shoving it off somewhere else because you have to borrow odds and it's one universe, there's no, <laughs> he didn't live to see the multiverse corruption come to pass, but within one universe, you borrow and you borrow and you borrow and you still have to pay for all that borrowing thermodynamically. So the same logical problem exists with horizontal transfer in orphans. You can't solve the problem by transferring it from another species. So we have A and B, that's an ortholog, they both have it, but here's our orphan, 
in y, uh, gene Y in A, and we say, well, we got it from B. Well, that means B had it originally, which means by definition, it's no longer an orphan. You've just moved it. And then you've got to get rid of it over there. So you haven't solved the problem at all. Horizontal transfer does not solve the problem. It just moves it around. And this is well understood. Unfortunately, this next solution is not well understood. But this is the current reigning evolutionary explanation for the origin of orphans, which is that they, rise, they arise directly from random nucleotide sequences. Bing, bing, you've got your genes. This is non-coding, this is coding. This is, if you go in the literature, currently the prevailing hypothesis for the origin of orphans. The problem is it doesn't work. Prior to the discovery of orphans, the antecedent probability that you could get a coding sequence from random DNA was considered effectively zero. That you could not go from random DNA to a functional polypeptide. Francois Jacob in the 70s said, it's, it's just not, never going to happen, practically zero. Things are different now, but there's still good reason to be skeptical. An encoded protein that serves some useful purpose, a promoter capable of initiating transcription, present in a region of open chromatin, these are all functional requirements to turn a random sequence of DNA into a functioning protein. You're not going to do it in just one step. So this author is clearly saying our random, our random origin hypothesis doesn't really solve the problem. We're just shoving it off. But this is really where the difficulty arises. There's actually no observational evidence that I know of that this ever happens. And you could do that. You could synthesize, just put together a string of DNA long enough to code for a globular protein, put it into a bacterial cell, and see if you get anything. And you, of course, you're not going to get anything. If you do, you'll get a poison. It won't be functional, and the cell will do everything it can to get rid of it. So the actual observational evidence for this mechanism Solving the problem is nil. It's nothing there. Now, these anomalies have led a lot of evolutionary biologists to say the universal tree never existed. So this microbiologist, Didier Raoult in Marseille, runs a very productive lab in France. And in his papers dealing with this topic over the past decade, he says, it's just not true. The tree of life concept is contrary to our current knowledge. Uh, and he says, you know, we've got this huge fraction of unique genes in every species we look at, bacterial species. He calls this due to gene creativity. <laughs> I can tell you he never defines this term, so this is attaching a name to a mystery. Uh, but there, what, there was no actual evolutionary process that he articulated for that. You know what, for sake of time, and so we can get to the animals, I'm just going to skip through all of these. These are just people saying the tree of life doesn't exist. By the way, anyone who wants this talk, I'll give you the PowerPoint. So if you want the references, and I have all the PDFs for all these papers, just see me afterwards. But let me get to the animals, and then, because I'm, I'm almost out of time. Well, the question is, do we have now real evidence, not counterfactual, real evidence lying outside the domain, to go back to our original question? Now, a little personal history. When I gave this talk, in the, I believe it was uh, summer of 2007, to a small research meeting in Chicago. Francis Collins, who's the head of the NIH, many of you have read his work, he's a Christian, theistic evolutionist, was sitting right where Alexander is, about that far away from me. And I gave a version of this talk, and Collins went like this. Classic hand wave, like, forget about it. And he said, Paul, nobody cares. Nobody cares. He says, we find orphans in viruses and prokaryotes, but they're weird. Their genetics are weird. There's lots of horizontal transfer going on. Who knows? It's not relevant. Until you find orphans in animals that show up on animal planet <laughs> that you can actually see and that people care about, he says, just not that interesting. Well, at the time, there weren't a lot of, at that mo moment, there weren't a lot of animal genomes available to respond to him, so I said, well, all right, you know, I think you're wrong, but all right. But let me just show you, this, this fraction is remarkably consistent. So here's a bacterial species that came from a deep core sample, and the predicted number of reading frames is a little over 2,100, and note 
the orphan's fraction is almost exactly 10%. So when you see a table like this published for a new prokaryotic species, look for the orphan's fraction and it will be bouncing around right here in about the 10 to 15% range. Remarkably consistent. How about eukaryotic genomes? Well, that, that was Colin's point. Don't find them. Well, he was wrong. Another thought experiment. These are a pair of mollusks thought to be related by common descent. This is called the ass's ear. It's sort of common name is the ass's ear. Kind of looks like a donkey's ear a little bit. This gets its name from its resemblance to the bone at the front of your knee, the patella gastropod. Thought to be related by common ancestry within the phylum mollusca. Now, what would you predict for how these two molluscan species should be constructing their calcareous shells via a mantle? You would expect, did I see my 10 minute? Is it good? Oh, I'm actually going to finish on time. Praise God, you know. <laughs> you would expect that they would be sharing genes and proteins to build this very complicated, looks simple, but it's not, this very complicated structure if they share common ancestry. So a group in Australia looked at this, and what they found was they couldn't be more different. Okay, so if you look at the genes and proteins involved in constructing what they call the secretome, which are, as the mantle is secreting these proteins to build that rigid structure, there's lots of them, and they looked at their sequences and they said 85% of them are novel, hadn't seen, been seen before, and only, well, less than a fifth have homologs in the other group. They're not building their shells the same way. They're building their shells using species-specific genes and proteins. So here's their conclusion from their paper. The unexpected complexity and evolvability, okay? When I see a phrase like that, the philosopher part of me turns on, and I, I say, you're putting a name to a mystery. What you saw actually falsified your prediction based on common descent. You just didn't let it do that. But what I love is their bottom line. There are significant molecular differences in the ways in which gastropods synthesize their shells. And this group in Australia has continued with this work, and they found the same signal in other groups. Species-specific genes and proteins for structures that are thought to have evolutionary common ancestry. A group in Germany, again, the Germans leading the way, have taken orphans very seriously. Have taken orphans very seriously. The, the morphology of freshwater polyp, this freshwater polyp hydra is specified by species-specific genes. The very form, so this is not a peripheral player in the, in the uh, biology of this organism. And they've gone on to say, and they did a really nice review paper in 2009 on this, orphans are biologically important and should not be ignored. But let me end with the ants, because we're, it's Proverbs, right? We're told to look, look to the ant. In 2010, 2011, six ant species had their genomes sequenced. And at the initial sequencing, there were very high fractions of species-specific genes. 18% for the fire ant, 18% and 14% for the Florida carpenter and Jordan's jumping. Now these will come down when you compare these species to each other because you have to do, be thorough and make sure you compare the genomes respectively among these groups. So these initial high numbers are just going into GenBank. When you actually compare the species, these numbers come down. 5.6, 11.1, 10.3. Same thing happens here. Notice how high these are on initial sequencing. Comparison brings them down, but they're still remarkably high. All right? We can take, oh, here's an important point. Here's a phylogeny for all of the ants. This is essentially a random sample. We have picked six species that interest us. They're agricultural pests, or like the leaf cutter, they have really interesting biology. But we're essentially doing a random draw from 14,000 ant species worldwide. There's no reason to think we happen to pick the six species that have anomalously high orphans fractions. So we can take the average from them, and it comes out to about 10%. All right, we're hitting about in that ballpark. And my guess is with other ant species, that's going to be pretty consistent. And there's no reason to think we've just picked the species that have a lot of orphans. Now, we can run the numbers. 
Well, look, just within the Mermisinae, a large group of ants, 5,800 species, average genome size about 17,000 open reading frames times the 10% orphans fraction, gives nearly 10 million unique genes just within that group. What happens when you extend that number to all 14,000 ant species? Where their probable common ancestor on the Darwinian view would have a genome of about this size. Well, here's a little cartoon. We'll look just at the Mermisinae. So there is, respectively, the probable genome size for their common ancestor. It's a box about 10 feet on a side, all right? Here are the number of unique sequences that have to be derived from that. 260 feet on a side, and these are obviously not to scale. At this moment, there is no plausible biological theory that I know of, and coming directly from random DNA is not plausible, to derive this much unique genetic information from a common ancestor with a genome of that size, which means that these nodes of common ancestry here, here, and these hypothetical ones, or well, they're all hypothetical, but <laughs> they're obviously hypothetical where the white lines come in. These are going to explode because there will be too much genetic diversity represented in these groups to be derived from a plausible common ancestor at these branching points. And this is happening already. And they're ubiquitous. So Francis Collins, I respect him, but he was dead wrong. Orphans are everywhere. So the water flea was sequenced recently. Over a third of its genes show no homology. They're unique just to that group. This little tick, the Lone Star tick, 71% are unique. Okay, I don't like ticks, but that's a pretty cool, <laughs> that's a pretty cool statistic. Lastly, how about us? Now, this is a paper that I expect to see overturned in my lifetime. Uh, at Eric Lander's lab in the States, in Boston, they were looking at orphans in the human genome. And at the time that they did this study, there were about 1,200 apparent open reading frames that were specific to Homo sapiens, and they threw them out. And they threw them out because they said, there's no plausible evolutionary mechanism to derive that many unique sequences in, our, in the time since our last common ancestor. So out they went. Now you could lose them on this branch, but that would be a lot of genes to lose. Maybe some of these aren't real genes, but I think the biologically healthy thing to do is ask, what are those sequences doing in the human genome? And don't throw them out just because you can't fix them, evolve them and fix them in the human genome in five to seven million years.